You may be seated. 7 years they had unbelievable success. 7 countries obliterated, 31 kings defeated. The Hebrew people were unstoppable. They hadn't always been. For 4 centuries they were slaves in Egypt. For 40 years they wandered like Bedouins in the wilderness. They didn't thrive. But they did during those seven years. That's when the Jordan River uh, opened up. The walls of Jericho fell down. The sun stood still and the kings of Canaan were driven from the land. What they accomplished was so amazing, the historian wrote, so the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. And the Lord gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Wow. A new season was born. Perhaps you need a new season. You don't need to cross the Jordan River but you need to heal a broken relationship. You aren't up against the walls of Jericho, but you need a new job, a better job, so you can get out of financial bondage. Sometimes the challenge is so great, it just feels like it sucks the life out of us. The book of Joshua is in the Bible for such a season. It challenges us to believe our best days are ahead of us. God has a promised land for us to take. Canaan symbolizes the victory we can have today. Uh, Canaan is not a metaphor for heaven. Heaven will have no enemies. In Canaan, they had at least seven enemy nations. Canaan represents the, does not represent the life to come. It represents the life we can have now. Canaan represents the victorious Christian life. The wilderness represents the defeated Christian life. In the wilderness, the Hebrews walked in circles. Victories were scarce. They were saved, but not strong. Saved from Pharaoh, but stuck in the desert. Sounds awful. It might sound familiar. I know many Christians who say they are stuck in a rut, stalled. They can tell you the day they escaped Egypt, but they can't tell you the last time they defeated a temptation. They're not alone in the wilderness. Willow Creek Community Church Reveal a Project interviewed over 200,000 Christians. They wanted to determine how many Christians uh, are propelled by their faith to love God and love people with their whole heart. How many Christians would say they are experiencing the power of the promised land life? Only 11%. Nearly 9 out of 10 believers, in other words, are languishing in the wilderness. Saved? Sure. Empowered? Nope. How do we explain the disconnect with so many of us caught in the land between Egypt and Canaan? The fact that we have this amazing power of new inheritance uh, available to us, but we're not experiencing it suggests that somehow pastors are miscommunicating how to access it. Listen to this true story about miscommunication. A woman was coming to a camp. Uh, she uh, was going to take a two-week vacation in Florida. And so she wrote to this camp. Uh, she, she was an uh, elegant woman, uh, kind of old-fashioned. Um, and she wanted to ask about the facilities they had there. And so she began to write a letter to the camp director, but she just couldn't just couldn't put the word toilet in her letter asking about that and so she thought about it and so she came up with the old-fashioned term bathroom commode so she was writing about that but then she thought even that seems too forward and so she finally decided just to say BC 
so she, she asked, uh, does the camp have its own BC facilities? That's what she wrote. Well, the camp director was not old-fashioned. He read her letter and he just couldn't figure out what she meant. It really stumped him, the BC. So after worrying about it for several days, he took it to other staffers and they couldn't figure out either what in the world she was talking about. Finally, he came to the conclusion that the lady must be asking about the local Baptist church. And so he sat down and he wrote the following reply. Dear Madam, I regret the delay in answering your letter, but I now take pleasure of informing you that the BC is located nine miles north of the campsite <laughs> and is capable of seating 250 people at one time. <laughs> I admit it is quite a distance away if you're in the habit of going regularly, but no doubt you'll be pleased to know that a great number of people take their lunches along <laughs> and make a day of it. They usually arrive early and stay late. The last time my wife and I went was six years ago, and it was so crowded we had to stand up the whole time we were there. It may interest you to know that right now there's a supper plan to raise money to buy more seats. They plan to hold a supper in the middle of the BC. <laughs> so everyone can watch and talk about this great event. I'd like to say it pains me very much not to be able to go more regularly. But it is surely not for lack of desire on my part. As we grow older it seems to be more and more of an effort, particularly in cold weather. <laughs> If you decide to come down to the campground, perhaps I could go with you the first time you go. Sit with you and introduce you to all the other folks. This is really a very friendly community. When you're miscommunicating with someone, it can really be pretty funny. But there's no reason to miscommunicate about the new inheritance promised land power available to every follower of Christ. If you invited Christ into your life, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in you. You have the same power in you that God used when he raised Christ from the dead. So why do we struggle through life? Our inheritance in Christ grants us power, but we feel like we're powerless. Why? I can think of two reasons. Stay with me. These are probably the two central messages of the book of Joshua. One, we forget that the Lord keeps his promises. Joshua writes, I will give you, or God says this, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the Le desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. God promised Joshua he would give them the promised land that he had promised to Moses. If Joshua got worried or wondered if they could really do it, all he had to do was remember that God had promised. And God keeps his promises. Do you know God's promises? Seven times in Joshua 21 and 23, Joshua tells the Israelites, God keeps all his promises. I've bolded all the references to promises. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn, sworn essentially means promised, to give their forefathers. And they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their forefathers. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord handed all their enemies over to them. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord, your God, fights for you just as he promised. Now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. This is Joshua at 110 years old. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. No one has, not one has failed. 
But all the good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to you. God promised the Israelites that he would drive out the Canaanites because of their wickedness, their rejection of God for 600 years and bring them into the land. And that's just what he did. He reminds the people that God keeps every one of his promises. When you're in the thick of the battle and you think God has forgotten you and wonder if God is capable of doing what he says he will do, it helps to know that God fulfills every one of his promises. You can cling to the promises of God. They are a lifeline. Sixty times we read in the book of Joshua that God promises the people of Israel that they can rise up and take possession of their inheritance. Is it time for you to take your inheritance? You have one. If you've given your life to Christ, God has given Canaan to you. Apostle Paul says he has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This may be the best kept secret in the Christian faith. We underestimate what happens to us at conversion. Most Christians view conversion as, uh, as a, as a thing kind of like a car wash. You come in a dirty car, you have your sins washed away, and you come out a clean car. But conversion is much more than a removal of sin. It's a deposit of power. It's as if your high mileage, two-cylinder uh, car, uh, have the engine taken out and God has replaced it with a Porsche engine. God removed the old motor, caked and cracked, and he replaced it with a humming, roaring version of himself. He's planted within you the essence of Christ. So the Apostle Paul writes, read this, this is a very famous verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. And then the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1, 18 to 20, read this with me. This is, uh, I have quoted this verse every week in this series. This has been the theme. Read it with me. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. It's not up there? Your voice okay? You, you prayed? I, come on, Dave. I heard you. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him as a ruler. Paul says we have incomparably great power within us. But often we live as if we don't know it. Receive yours. You are embedded with resurrection power. Though you can't control your tongue, God can. Though you can't control your sexual urges, God can. Though you can't forgive, God can. The wilderness mentality says, I am weak, I'll always be weak. Inheritance people say, I was weak, but I'm getting stronger. Wilderness people say, I am a victim of my situation. Promised land people say, I'm a victor in spite of my circumstances. Wilderness people say, these are tough days. I'll never get through them. God's people say, say God has promised me incomparably great power. God will get me through. After the 1991 Super Bowl, headlines in papers all around our country had all to do with Scott Norwood's kick. Scott Norwood played for the Buffalo Bills. Buffalo Bills had not won a major sports championship since 1965. But in the 1991 Super Bowl, it appeared that the ball was kind of finally going to bounce their way. The game went back and forth with the New York Giants, and it got to the, the end of the fourth quarter, and uh, the Giants were ahead by one point. 
the Bills drove down to the Giants' 29-yard line. They only had time for one more play. That's when they turned to Scott Norwood, their kicker. All pro, highest scorer on their team. That season, he made 32 out of 37 field goals. He had made five from this distance or greater. He only had to make a sixth one. And so he, he came into the game and he tuned out the crowd. He kind of went through his pre-kick routine, paced it off and visualized seeing it go through. Stepped back, waited for the snap, came forward, kicked it, kept his head down, followed through. He looked up when the ball was three-fourths of the way to the goal. That's when he knew he had missed it. The wrong crowd erupted. All of Buffalo groaned. He couldn't get a do-over, couldn't get a mulligan. Scott Norwood hung his head. He came out of the game with uh, his head down. For days, he couldn't get the thought of his missed kick out of his mind. He couldn't sleep. He came back to Buffalo upset. Even though they lost, the city threw a celebration for the team. So he went that day and he stood on the platform with the rest of the team. He tried to stand in the back where nobody would notice him. But the fans seemed to have another idea. As a civic leader was giving a speech, the crowd began to talk, began to chant, We want Scott! Civic leader continued to go on, but they got louder and louder. We want Scott! He stood in the back where nobody could see him. He didn't come out. He couldn't figure out why they would want to see him. But finally, the civic leader had to stop because they got so loud and the teammates pushed him out to the front. When they saw Scott, they erupted. Yeah, he'd missed the kick, but they wanted to make sure that he knew that he was still part of their community. The Bible says that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Saints who have lived before us, who have gone to heaven like Abraham and Peter and David and Paul and Grandma and your uncle and looking down from heaven, cheering you on. We all make mistakes. Don't wallow in your failures. God has promised you family and brothers and sisters and friends looking down from heaven to encourage you to go forward. What's the promise of God you need to claim today? To the bereaved, weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. To the sick, the Lord sustains them on their sick bed and restores them from their bed of illness. To the stumbler, my grace is sufficient for you. To the weak, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. To the lonely, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. To the tempted, I will provide a way of escape. Claim the promise. God keeps his promises. There's a second reason we get stalled and stuck amid the struggle of life. We forget that the Lord fights for us. This may be the most important message from the book of Joshua. Nod and Curry was 13 years old. He was no more than 100 pounds, dripping wet. Teenage boys, uh, you know, attacked him and uh, just tormented him. They beat him, they, they kicked him. His mom had moved the family from Minnesota to Philadelphia that year. She lost her job as a hotel maid. And uh, so she came looking for work in Philadelphia. 
In 2000, she brought the family from war-torn Liberia. Now it was 2011. Nadin was uh, 13 years old. And these boys would attack him. There were like seven of them regularly, like a group of bullies. And uh, they'd humiliate his, uh, they'd talk about his mom. He, humiliating words about his mom. She was an unemployed immigrant. Perfect target for bullies. They would torment him every day, but their all-out assault came on a January morning. They dragged him through the snow. They stuffed him up in a tree. He got free and came down, so they grabbed him again, and then they uh, hooked him up by his coat uh, to a, a rod iron France. Just watch a little bit of this YouTube. This cell phone video shows a 13-year-old boy being kicked, dragged through the snow, and then hoisted into a tree by his alleged attackers. In the video we have blurred to protect their identities, he tries to run away but is caught again. And finally, after several attempts, the bullies hang him by his jacket on a tall metal fence. The attacks probably would have gone on and maybe gotten worse, except for the mistake of one of the bullies. He filmed the whole deal and posted it on YouTube. A passerby chased the bullies away and the police got wind of it and learned about it and they put the boys in jail. One of the staffers on the morning show The View saw it, uh, the YouTube, and they invited him on uh, to one of their shows. And so as the video was playing, uh, his lip quivered as he told his story. They also invited three other people on the show that morning. He didn't know about that. Three, uh, as, the, as the YouTube uh, video stopped, three huge guys walked out onto the stage, members of the Philadelphia Eagles football team. One of the all-pro, uh, Dijon Jackson, came and sat right by Nadin, and, uh, and he said to him, Hey, man, if you're ever in trouble, just give me a call. I got two huge buddies here. He had two 300-pound guys with him. And Nadin's eyes got wide as he took that jersey and signed it and gave it to him. And he says, Now remember, if you ever need help, and then, he, and then he, he gave him in front of all the bullies in, the, in, in America his cell phone number. Bullies think twice about attacking somebody who's got the cell phone of, of an of a NFL player in his phone. All, for, for all the way, the rest of the way, uh, Nodden has just been a phone call away from his personal bodyguards. You have that protection too. God gives you the same promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? If you get anything out of this message this morning, get this. God fights for you. This changes everything. Because God is strong, you are strong. Because God is able, you are able. Since he has no limits, you have no limits. This is possibly the biggest news of the book of Joshua. God not only stays with you, he fights for you. Before he dies, Joshua recounts many of the times God fought for the Israelites. Go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. The Lord your God is giving you rest and giving you this land. Before crossing the Jordan River, the Lord will do wonders before you. The Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan. Before the battle with Jericho, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Joshua says, you yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. 
One of you routs a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. I love this image of a Hebrew soldier with sword drawn chasing a battalion of enemies. He's outnumbered a thousand to one but because God fights for him they scatter like scared pigeons. The entire book of Joshua reads like this. God claiming, God giving, God fighting. They didn't conquer the land on their own power. God fought for them. It's the same with us. Christian life does not depend all on your strength, your faith. It hangs on God's strength and God's power. Christ won the victory for us when he died on the cross and was raised again from the dead. Christian victory does not depend on your strength. You admit your weakness and that you're a failure without Christ. You don't put any confidence in yourself. You place your trust in him. You may be in a marital situation or a parenting issue or dealing with a problem at work or school where you say, if God doesn't come through, there's no way. That very sense of helplessness puts you exactly where you need to be to live the Christian life. You depend on Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. You were not made to quake in fear. You were not made to limp through life. You are a living, breathing expression of God. Once more, he fights for you. Is this a new thought? You've heard about the God who made you, the God who watches over you, who directs you and knows you, but the God who fights for you? God fights for you. Just let those words sink in for a minute. The big news of Joshua is not that you fight for God, but that God fights for you. Miss this truth and you might as well plant your mailbox in the wilderness. You'll be there a long time. But believe this, and the clouds begin to clear. Look at this. Joshua chapter 12. Here's a list of the kings of the land that Joshua and the Israelites conquered on the west side of the Jordan. From Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon to Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir. I want you to read these with me. Don't worry about the names. Some of them, you know, you'll get tripped over. Just, you know, don't worry about those. But I kind of want us to emphasize at the end the word one, okay? We'll just kind of... Okay, here we go. The king of Jericho, one. The king of Ai, near Bethel, one. The king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. The king of Jarmuth, one. Let me hear the word one a little more. The king of Lachish, one. The king of Eglon, one. The king of Gezer, one. The king of Deber, one. The king of Gader, one. The king of Hormah, one. The king of Arad, one. The king of Libna, one. The king of Adullam, one. The king of Makeda, one. The king of Bethel, one. The king of Tapua, one. The king of Hefer, one. The king of Aphek, one. The king of Lasharon, one. The king of Madden, one. The king of Hazor, one. Now let's build it up a little bit toward the end here. The king of Shibron Meron, one. The king of Oxfa, one. The king of Tanakh, one. King of Megadu, one. The king of Kadesh, one. The king of Jokneum in Carmel, one. The king of Dor in Naphath Dor, one. The king of Goyim in Gedlau, one. The king of Tirzah, one. Thirty-one kings in all. Joshua 31, Canaanites, zero. It reads like the record for the Connecticut women's basketball team. <laughs> 
Imagine your list. Envision the day you stand before Jesus and he reviews your life with you. He'll give you the praise that is your due, the victories you won, greed, one, explosive temper, one, envy, one, abused as a child yet stable as an adult, one, straight off course yet returned with vigor, one, battled with lust but came out a victor, one, I'd like you to take your program uh, 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 inside is, is, uh, is an outline at the bottom. I'd like you to just to put your name in this. Uh, uh, so there's pens under every seat in the house. Or supposed to be. Uh, and just write your name in there as, as, as I read through this. this is, these are words directly out of Joshua. The Lord gave... Uh, you know what in the in the text it's the Israelites uh, the Hebrews but I want you to put your name the Lord gave write your name in there all the life he had sworn to give and then write your name and Ron took possession of it the Lord gave write your name rest all around and not an enemy stood not a world failed of any good thing which the Lord had promised write your name just imagine it. You at full throttle. You experiencing God's incomparably great power. You as God intended you to be. Isn't it time for you to change your mailing dress from the wilderness to the promised land? Lord, thank you for your amazing promises that you gave us in this book, but really, as Dave said earlier, throughout the Bible, and the greatest promise comes in Jesus. Lord, we don't want to live weak lives, stumbling, limping through life. We want to experience your power. So I want to give you a moment just to talk to God about that right now. We've got our heads down. Maybe tell God about something you're facing that's just got you stuck, afraid. Tell him about it. He knows about it. But tell him you want to live out his incomparably great power, resurrection power, the Holy Spirit's power, inheritance power inside of you. You want to live on a higher plane this week. Would you tell him that? You pray. Thank you, Father, that you don't leave us alone, powerless, but you give us your power within us, embedded within us when we commit our lives to you. Help us to use that power this week. In Jesus' name, amen.